Hello, my came 116 plus. I wonder, came 116 and not 115 double clover. All right, I checked it. I am under, I'm doing using the backbook clover ultra under the came 116 course. Um, so today I'm going to start week five material. So this video is for 29th. I think I put down 29th September in the. Let me. I'm gonna fix that as soon as this is over. I'll have to fix that. I don't know which day. Like 29th September. Wow, this is July. All right. The name of the video, <laughs> title of the video. For some reason, I wrote 29th September. So I'm gonna fix that as soon as this is over. Uh, anyways, uh, without further ado, let's start. Week five, which mostly focuses on electrochemistry. So week five focuses on electrochemistry. But before that, there are a couple of topics. Uh, I think I didn't teach you. Well, there were a lot uh, in acids and base chapter, uh, but there are, there are a couple that I think is important for you to know. So you are at least able to compare the acid strength based on scales and based on the pK values. So that's what I'm going to first spend my 15 to 15 minutes, my first 10 to 15 minutes on. And again, a reminder that <clears throat> the lecture videos that I will create, they will be only for Wednesday and Thursday this week. There were not any video lectures for Monday and Tuesday. <clears throat> All right, so like I said, so these are the kind of leftover material from this list. One of the few leftover materials, but I thought this was important to understand. That's why I'm going to show you how to work this out. And then these questions are on Alex as well. So this is something that might ring a bell. Use this slide as a review for you. It just, if given the reaction between a base and water or, or a base acid, and water, and base and water, what are the products, and then how can you write down the acid this is some constant or acid ionizing constant or base ionizing constant or base, base dissociation constant. So this is just a review for you. All right. So basically what you have seen or what you might have memorized is basically higher the K value, the stronger the acid, right? Higher the KB value, the stronger the base. And one of the reasons that is true is because in my K, the concentration of H3O plus, which is my product, when K is high, this H3O plus is kind of high as well, relatively high. So when that is high, not surprisingly, since pH is related to the strength of acid and pH equals to minus log of H3O plus, right? So straight increasing the concentration of H3O plus increases the value of Ka, right? Whenever the K increases, we kind of related that to PK and such. So the take home message is higher the K value, which means stronger the acid, meaning you'll have higher concentration of H3O plus. So this, do not confuse you with this yet. All right, just think about that. We don't bring in the pH formula yet. All right, so, and the next thing, the conjugate acid base, to use this as a review for you, how you can make a conjugate base from an acid. All right, so if you have, let's say, acid like H2O, how can you make a conjugate base, which is OS minus, All right? The other form is if you have a base, how can you make a conjugate acid? Right, so you remove H plus for the first one, you add H plus for the second one. So make sure you're comfortable with that. And then know how to identify this acid base, conjugate base and conjugate acid. 
And finally, this is something I talked about in when I talked about acid base chapter is basically how does the K value relate to the relative acid strength, right? So as you go from right to left in this chart, the K value increases, being that the acid gets stronger and stronger, right? Now, what we have said is if an acid is strong, let's say H3O plus, then its conjugate base, which is going to be water, is going to be the weakest base. And that's why in the bottom, what happens is as you go from right to left, the base strength increases. All right, so again, I'm going to repeat that. Whenever the K value is high, the acid is relatively strong. Whenever the KB value is high, the base is relatively strong. All right, so now whenever you have a strong acid, what we're saying if a acid is strong, its conjugate base is going to be the weakest base. That's why S2 plus was the strongest acid, its conjugate base, which is H2O, is going to be the weakest acid. Be comfortable with these two. Chart, if you want to call it. All right, so let's see how Alex asks you the equation. So it's asking you to determine the strength of acid from the sketch that they have. So I'm looking at this sketch. Let's look at solution one for right now. So in solution one, so then they have told me this is water, right? Not surprisingly, because remember, we can determine the strength of acid by dissolving in water and looking at how much H2O plus. Is being furnished by the solution, right? The more the H3O plus, the higher the K or the stronger the acid, right? All right, so now for my solution one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count all my acid, my conjugate base, my water, and then my hydronium ion. All right, so this is my water because this is what they told me here. All right, that water is going to react with my acid. HA. I'm going to second that my acid HA. Right? So you have that water. Right? So I'm going to just draw the mm, black for the hydrogen atom. How about that? So you have the water. Then you have the acid. So when they react, this is the black. What you're going to get is the hydronium ion, right? That's the oxygen and the three H's. So that's my hydronium ion, right? So I'm just going to put the equilibrium arrow for right now. And this is my acid. I'm just going to call it HA. And then this is my water, right? And then I'm going to get my best conjugate base. A minus here. All right, so I hope now this picture makes sense to you. All right, so basically, this is your water, this is your hydronium ion, this is your acid, and then acid, and then this is your conjugate base. All right, so based on that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start doing the same thing for all those pictures solution one, solution two, solution three, and solution four. And then one thing about this is, if you look at my K, my formula is concentration of S3O plus, right? The hydronium ion, or how much the concentration of the conjugate base and the concentration of H. Since water does not swap in my equilibrium concentration, right? so I'm just not going to count my water. I hope this makes sense. So I'm going to disregard the water. So beside that, what this tells me is I have one acid, right? one conjugate base and then one s3 o plus solution one my solution two what does it tell me is basically i have again i'm not counting my water my hydrogen ion let's start with my acid first so this is my acid right the hydrogen connected to this i don't know what cream colored ball h and a right it's my acid that's why one is acid for my solution two and then 
one, two, three, four conjugate bases. So whenever I say conjugate bases, think about this part right here, right? This is my conjugate base. And then how many hydronium ion? One, two, three, and four hydronium ion. Four is three or plus. All right. I'm not going to do the solution three. You can just count it yourself. All right. So it's going to have six acids, acid molecule. All right. So this molecule right here. I'm going to have two conjugate bases and then two hydronium ion. And then finally, solution four is an interesting one. What you see is you see hydronium ion. All right. You see how many? One hydronium ion. Right, and you see one conjugate base, and like I told you, to know if it's acid or base, if the white ball is connected to this cream colored ball, that's your acid HA. All right, so I don't have the white ball uh, colored ball here connected to the blue colored ball, that's why this is my conjugate base. So, one conjugate base. All right, now my solution four tells me that there is not any acid left, right. None. So anytime you do not have any acid, that means all the acid reacted with water to give you hydronium ion and the conjugate base. So if you see that kind of scenario, that tells you that's definitely the strongest acid, right? Other way to think about this is my in my K expression, this H A is zero. So something divided by zero is infinity. Since K is infinity, means that's really high. That's why. K is the highest area for source and four. That's why source and four is my strongest one. Source and four is my number one, our strongest acid, right? Now let's look at the other one. For the other one, all I do is, is basically I can put in the number of acids, conjugate bases into my equation here and then solve and do my math, right? And then whenever the K is higher, my acid is stronger, right? For my, I'm just gonna show you for solution one, my solution for solution, solution one, my Ka is gonna be hydronium ion. I'm gonna have one of those times the A minus conjugate base is gonna have one of those. My acid, I have one of them. That's why K equals to one. All right, so how this making sense and you do the same thing for all of them and in the end, you're gonna get something like this. Yeah. And the other important thing that you should have noticed, right, is basically the concentration. Remember, to get this H3O plus and B minus, right, this is basically has to break apart and form a hydronium ion and then B minus. And that's why, if you look at the number of conjugate base and the H3O plus, they are the same for all the solutions. Look at that one conjugate base, one hydronium ion for solution one. Four conjugate bases, four hydronium ion for solution two. Two conjugate bases, two hydronium ion for solution three. All right. And then one hydronium ion and one conjugate base for solution four. So I hope this makes sense. I'm moving on. Next topic. Okay, first the noise pick one. All I'm asking, I'll probably ask you, I haven't created the question yet. I think my goal is to create the question uh, and put it on eCampus by midnight tonight. And meanwhile, go to the PowerPoint slides and then try to answer it, your knowledge check questions on a piece of paper. Work it out. So basically, I'm just asking you what is the formula for the acid anison constant, which we just talked about right now. But then I want you to think about this conceptually as, as to what it means, rather than trying to just memorize, oh, K equals to H3O plus times the conjugate base divided by HA. I think about it conceptually, what it means. All right, so we talked about the conjugate base Acid conjugate base, acid and conjugate base, right? So basically, what we had said was if the acid is stronger, its conjugate base is the weakest, right? If the acid is the weakest, its conjugate base is the strongest. All right, and we can see that clearly based on the K and the KV value. Now, based on that, let's try to answer one of the other Alex questions. So it's asking us to determine the acid base strength from the conjugate. So they will give you this species, 
and they'll ask us what is the relative pH of 0 0.1 molar IQ solution. All right, so remember, whenever someone asks you relative pH, remember, just think about this scale, right? 7, 0, and 14, that means a stronger acid has the pH close to 0, and a stronger base has a pH close to 14, right? And then as you go from 0 to 7, the strength of acid decreases. As you go from 14 to 7, the strength of base increases, right? Sorry, decreases. And one thing to keep in mind, right? Whenever I say that, okay, the strength of base, de base decreases as you go from 14 to 7, means you can think it in other way as well. That means the strength of the acid is increasing as the strength of base is decreasing from 14 to 7. All right. All right. So to answer this question, there have been your species, about eight, yeah, eight of them. And then they're asking you to rank these. And the good thing is they have made your life easy by ranking these. Look at this. Right, that means all that you do is figure out for CLO to minus, HCO minus, F minus, HCO plus, and SCO. Right? All right, so the way to do this, the way to think about this is basically I'm going to first go to my all my acids. And the way I know that is basically anything with the H in it and that does not have negative sign is my acid. So that means this is my acid. Right, what is already done? Don't worry about it. This is my acid, this is my acid, and then this is my acid. So first, I'm going to rank them. Not surprisingly, they will have the lowest pH. Right? Now, I'm done by water, HF, and HClO2. Right? Where does H3O plus fall then? So this is an acid as well. Right? So now, since this is an acid and everything else is the base, not surprisingly, this is going to have the number one. Or this is going to have the lowest pH. And the other way to figure that out is if you are given the pK values of these. If you look up the pK values, what we had said was lower the pK, stronger the acid. All right. This S3 plus is going to have the lowest pK. That's why that is going to be the strongest acid. The strongest acid means lowest pH. That's why this is going to be number one. All right. Number two is already figured out. Number three is already figured out. All right. Now this is my under acid at COH. That means not surprisingly, this is going to be my number four. Let me write number four here. So I hope this is making sense. That's how I do number. Right? Again, if you're confused about oh how should why should I put number four, the other method is basically just go and find these PK values of these, and then you'll be able to figure out which one are the strong acids. Right. So I'm going to write that down and try to make a chart similar to this chart to figure out for the remaining four species, right? So now what is that telling me is S3O plus is the strongest acid followed by SCLO2, so that is my rank number two, followed by HF, followed by number four, I figured that out as SCOOH. This is the ranking of my assets. All right, so next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the conjugate basis of them all. Don't even don't, don't worry about this, and I'll tell you why I asked you to do that, right? I'm going to write on the conjugate base of this. This is going to be a water, conjugate base of H3O plus, because I remove the H plus, I get water. I'm going to write down the conjugate base of HClO2, right? It's going to be ClO2 minus. Conjugate base of HF is F minus. And conjugate base of HCOOH is, you can either write that out as COOH minus or HCO minus. I'll write it the way this Alex has given me because for to make conjugate base, all I do is remove this H, right? That's how I get at CO minus, right? Now, what did we tell her earlier? The stronger the acid, 
the weaker its conjugate base. All right. So what I can say is, write down this. This water is the weakest base among the four here. Weakest base. And this is going to be my strongest base. And as you go from water to this yellow to minus to F minus to HCO minus, the strength of the base increases. But what does that mean when the strength of the base increases? Means look at my pH scale. The pH value increases as well. Right? So let's say if this was seven, that means this HCO minus might go to, I'm just going to randomly throw a number, let's just say 11. Right? And this is going to be, let's just say, eight and 9.5 pH values. All I have to do is rank all of these, right? So I've done my one, two, three, four, and not surprising, look at that, my water is number five, right? All right, so I'm because this is my fifth one with seven. So this number might confuse you. So again, again, these numbers, what I'm telling you is this is just relative. I'm telling you the pH value of this water is going to be lower than the pH value of this HCO minus because water is the weakest base. That's why water is my number five. The next one after water is CLO2 minus, which is going to be my number six. F minus is going to be number seven. And then HCO minus is my number eight. All right, so this is how we can figure out the acid base strength from their conjugates. Okay, take your time. Internalize this. All right, and just the statement that I used to answer this question is basically the stronger the acid, the weaker it's conjugate based, based on this chart that I talked about. All right, so this is what your knowledge check two is gonna ask you. So I have provided you some species like H2CO3 and S4 plus and NH3. Water, hydrogen carbonate anion, hydroxide anion, and all I have to do is figuring out the same method that I just told you here. I'm asking you to. Or this species by, keep this in mind, not by increasing pH. I'm here, this asks you to order these by increasing pH, right? But here I'm asking you to by increasing the strength of H3O plus. Keep that in mind. There's a little twist to this. Think about that. All right, and then if you are looking for K and KB values, I do right here. Look at that, my H2CO3 and S4 plus are all here. H2CO3, S4 plus, and all the species that I've asked you for knowledge check two are all present there. And again, I'm repeating it. You are supposed to order the species by increasing concentration of H3O plus. All right, and remember, as three or plus, pH are related this way. All right, so now, after that, maybe some of you we're waiting for a lot is electrochemistry that I'm going to start talking about. All right, so right now, for my first half of this lecture, I'll probably uh, finish these two topics the review of redox chemistry and then galvanic cells. And then in the second half of the lecture for today, I'll talk about electrode and cell potentials. I think I'm going to talk about electrode. I forgot, yes, not about cell potential in the first part of the lecture today here. All right. All right, so <clears throat> if some of you might have seen the charging station, right? Tesla comes to your mind, I'm supposing, electric car. Like there are other companies like Toyota and then Nissan and then Mercedes, Volvo, I don't know, all of them are now in the kind of like uh, making all electric car, right? Now, if you think about this electric car, they will use battery to power themselves, right? But then remember battery, they drain up for a certain time, you have to charge the battery, all right? So basically when you are charging the battery, keep in mind what you're doing is you are using electrical energy just do something in the battery, right? Something in the battery, all right? Now to define that, what that something is, is basically, well, probably doing some kind of a chemical change in the battery that charges the battery, all right? So basically, what we're gonna talk about is 
probably focus more on a lot on galvanic cells. When I say cell C L L S. Right, not the human cell. Think about this as battery whenever I use this term cells. And we're gonna learn as to how does the chemical reaction or this transfer of electron help, let's say, power something up is what we're gonna focus on in this chapter. And the first thing is let's talk about what the heck is electrochemistry, right? Not surprisingly, like the name says, electro meaning electricity, and then chemistry means if there's some kind of a physical or chemical reactions or chains, we have defined that as chemistry, right? Besides that, you might have learned is to study the properties of matter uh, and various other properties of matter, all right? So in electrochemistry, what we do is we study electricity, but then we study as to how the chemical reactions that's taking place is creating this electricity. All right, and then to create electricity in electrochemistry, what we're gonna see is basically all the reactions that we're gonna talk about. All they use is electricity to make electricity every time there is movement of electrons from one element to another. Right, or you know, the word transfer of electrons from one element to another. And in Chem 115, what have you learned is basically whenever there is this transfer of electron from one element to another, that kind of reaction is also called a redox reaction. And on the word oxidation reduction reaction. Right now, I have to be real careful whenever I say this word transfer because that might uh, develop some misconceptions as to whenever I say transfer of electrons, that's more like ionic bond right forming ionic bonds so let me use the term movement of electrons all right and then you might have learned that movement of electrons is what causes current to flow in the wire right so whenever there is current means not surprisingly you can create electricity and that's what electrochemistry is Right, so first, I'm going to review real chemistry that you learned in Chem 115. If you're in my class, I did not show you how to. Uh, if you if you're in my Chem 115 class, we didn't go in depth on how to balance the redox reactions in acidic and basic solution. But then here during the review, I'm going to talk about that. All right. But other than that, in Chem 115, you all were taught these two concepts. But having said that, I'm gonna go through them really quick. All right, so basically, when we think about redox reaction, so if there are ionic species, what happens is there is the transfer of electrons between reactant species Right, so basically transfer of electron from one reactant species to another, and then you get ionic product. Right. And the reason we say this is a redox reaction or oxidation re reaction reaction is because the electron that was given up by sodium, right, is taken up by chlorine gas to form this. Right. And that's why I like the term movement of electrons rather than transfer, because that's what happens in whenever I show other examples, there's going to be movement of electrons from one species to another. All right, and then the ionic product is formed. Now the question is, okay, but how do I know there's transfer of electron, right? I haven't shown you anything here in this reaction. And the way I know that is basically by looking at something called half reactions. And to write down the half reaction is basically you break the reactants into two halves, right? So what I did was my reactant. I make this balanced reaction. That's really important. And that's true for anything, right? Whenever you solve for person yield, whenever you solve for limiting reagent, whenever you solve for even redox reaction, the reaction must be balanced. All right? So if you look at the product side, since I know that this is my ionic compound, right? I know that ionic compound 
can be broken down as ionic, anionic, and cationic counterparts. That's why do NaCl can be broken down into two Na plus and two Cl minus, right? So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask them. I'm going to mask this 2Na with the 2Na plus. Write that down. Cl2 with the Cl minus and write that down. All right. Then what you're going to see is if you get the product site at the top here in the first half reaction. Do you see how I have two positive charge on the product side? That means to balance that, I must write down plus two electrons because the electron has a negative one charge. And whenever I do that, this balances out, right? And look at that. This doesn't have any charge. That's why it's zero. Overall, this is zero as well, All right? I'm gonna do the same thing in the second after reaction. In the second after reaction, I have two negative one charge. All right, because chloride, chloride anion has negative one charge, two times negative one is negative two. All right, so basically to kind of balance that out, I'm going to write down plus two electron in my reactant side. All right, so now if you look at this on my reactant side, I have negative two charge. In my product side, I have negative two charge as well. This is how I write my half reactions. Now, a couple of things that you should have noticed is basically whatever electron that the sodium lost, right? So it lost two electrons. If it is a redox reaction, the other reactant must absorb that or take in that two electrons to form its counter anion. All right. So now this is called one half of the half half reaction and this is the other half of the reaction for the half reaction so i hope you are getting comfortable and this, since this is more like a review all right so some of the issue i've noticed is like sodium solid it lost electrons right it lost two electrons matter matter of fact whereas chlorine gas it gained those two electrons right And in chemistry, we just give these fancy term. Whenever something gains electrons, whenever something a species loses electron, we say that, or I use this mnemonic, Leo the lion says, "Ger." Right? Loss of electron is oxidation. Any lost electrons, that's why this process is going to be oxidation. And Cl2 gained electron gain of electron is reduction that's why this process is my reduction and i'm going to go further now all right i'm going to call this since this went oxidation so i'm going to call this my oxidation half reaction right now this right here is going to be called my reduction half the reason it's important is because I'm going to start talking about electrode, anode, cathode, and I might say something like, oh, in the anode is where the oxidation half occurs, or in cathode is where reduction half occurs. That's why I want you to be comfortable with these terminologies that I'm using. All right. Now, okay, so pine and dandy, this is the same reaction that you talked about in the earlier slide. So what gives? So now we're going to start using this term. Earlier, I used the term sodium underwent oxidation, chlorine underwent reduction. Right? Now let's talk about the oxidizing agent and reducing agent. Right? The easiest way I ask students to think about this is anything that's oxidized or anything that's underwent oxidation is always going to be a reducing agent, right? Because one way to think about this is something that underwent oxidation, right? Had to reduce something else, isn't it? The sodium underwent oxidation, but what it did was it reduced the chlorine. That's why we are saying that species 
that underwent oxidation is termed as a releasing agent. That means here, sodium is going to be my releasing agent because it underwent oxidation or it oxidized, whatever you want, however you want, you have been learning or whatever is easy for you to remember for a long while. All right, that means all the species has to be my oxidizing agent. All right, that means my chlorine gas is going to be my oxidizing agent. Right, for your next knowledge check, I've made your life really, really easy. What I'm asking you is what is oxidized, what is reduced, and what are the oxidizing and reducing agents when one mole of sodium metal reacts with 0 0.5 mole of chlorine gas. So be straightforward. I've given you lots and lots of hints in the previous two slides. Use that slide. And again, that mole number that I gave you is just to distract you. You don't need to focus on that because all you know is Leo the lines is GER. Right? The of electron is oxidation. Something that went underwent oxidation is going to be a reducing agent. Right? Gain of electron is reduction. Something that underwent reduction is going to be a oxidizing agent. All right, that's your knowledge three. Me on now. Now, so this example, right? So let's say this example right here. Uh, all right. There is on the way think about as to why this is oxidation, right? We said this is my, well, this is my oxidation half, right? The sodium lost electron, that's for oxidation, right? But other way to think about oxidation, right, is basically when there is increase in positive charge, that is termed oxidation, right? Look at this. This sodium, it's a solid. It's neutral, means it doesn't have any charge zero. But in my peroxide, do you see how this has plus one charge? And my definition told me that if there is increase in positive charge, that is called oxidation. If there is increase in negative charge, that process is called reduction. Look at this. This chlorine is going to be zero because it's neutral. All right, are going to have a charge of zero if you're confused as to what I mean by zero. All right, then it gets two electrons, it went to minus two. And what I said is increase in the negative charge is termed as reduction. The two ways to think about this, whatever floats your boat. All right, all right, now this example that I gave you was for ionic, of ionic compound, right? And it's so. now my question to you is right. Basically, so what? Don't any of the covalent compound or any reactions that involve covalent compound do don't they ever go redox reaction, oxidation reduction reaction? And guess what? They do undergo oxidation and reduction reaction, right? And that's where to kind of understand as to how to understand the oxidation reduction of reactions that only involve covalent compounds something called oxidation number concept has been developed all right so basically this is more like a bookkeeping technique right we kind of give all these elements that are involved in the reactions a charge it doesn't matter if it's covalent or ionic but if it's covalent we give it a charge Assuming as if the compound was ionic. All right, because here I gave you the charge, right? Sodium is easy to see, sodium is plus one, right? But then what about, let's say, if I have C6H12O6? There is no ionic bond. How can we give you plus or minus charge, right? You might question that. And that's when what I'm telling you is with the covalent compound, would, we are giving, based on these rules, this oxygen number as if the covalent compounds were acting as ionic compounds. 
all right so again these rules is from k1 frame this is more like a review for you all right so first rule the number of all elements in their standard state is zero it doesn't matter right if sodium solid oxygen number is going to be zero because it, it, this is in its standard state and in its elemental form right cl2 chlorine is in its standard state right because remember have no fear of ice cold beer have no fear of ice cold beer right hydrogen nitrogen fluorine oxygen iodine ice cold beer have no fear of ice cold beer chlorine sorry and then bromine these all elements they exist in their diatomic forms and this is their standard state and that's why my first rule tells me that in the standard state the oxygen number is zero that's why this chlorine is going to have zero oxygen number my second rule tells me that hydrogen is always plus one sorry yes always plus one except whenever it's in a hydride form so what I'm, what i mean by hydride form is basically something like nah right sodium hydride right in other words if the hydrogen is connected to mostly like metals it's considered hydride and in that case hydrogen is going to have minus one assign the oxygen number minus one other than that in any other cases right something like hcl right let's say h3po4 it is always assigned the oxygen number of plus one that means this hydrogen has plus one this hydrogen has plus one as well all right oxygen number of oxygen is always negative two except for peroxide anytime you see o2 kind of thing most of the time it is peroxide in peroxide it is minus one other than that in every other compound oxygen is always minus two right meaning that if you have water right oxygen is always going to be minus two right and then we said earlier the hydrogen is also going to be plus one you get that overall two times plus one is plus two plus two plus minus minus two is zero that's why water is a neutral molecule right number four rules tells me that oxygen number of metal in an ionic compound is equal to charge of cation right so that means any has a plus one charge that's why its oxygen number is plus one lf3 aluminum charge it's in group if you look at the period table right it's in group 15 and group 15 there are always three plus right at least aluminum if it's a metal that's why this aluminum has three plus or is given the assigned the oxygen number of three plus here on the example let's say if i have calcium hydroxide right calcium is in group two meaning that it always is going to have plus two charge that's why the number four rule tells me that oxygen number of metal in an ionic compound is the charge of it and that means this is the oxygen number of calcium in calcium hydroxide all right so for number five halogen is always minus one right if you think about high hydrogen fluoride this is a halogen it's minus one hydrogen fluoride chlorine is a halogen it's minus one as well and so on right there's going to be some exception one of the exception is when that halogen is a central atom for example if you have cl2o7 the chlorine is going to be a central atom because the structure of this molecule which even i had to look up all right is, i don't know who gave this example all right it's basically looks like this cl o cl and then all these oxidants all right you don't have to worry about the structure right i'm just trying to show you so since this halogen do you see how this chlorine is in the center right in this loose touch structure and this is the time when its oxygen number will not be negative one right if i do my thing i'm going to end up with oxygen is always minus two that's why it's seven times minus two is minus 14 now to balance this out this chlorine has to be plus seven 
right? And we'll work through this example. Don't worry about this. But again, all I'm saying is since this is not a central, this is a central atom, and that's why hydrogen will not have an oxidation number of negative one. And last one, if the sum of the oxygen number must equals to total charge for the compounds. That means let's say if I have let's say SO42 minus, right? My rule is telling me that if I add up the oxygen number of sulfur here and the oxygen number of four of the atoms of oxygen, when I add those oxygen numbers, they must add up to two minus. If I have water, it's a neutral compound, means it doesn't have any charge, means if I add up the oxygen number of hydrogen and oxygen, they must add up to zero. That's what group six is all about. All right, so let's work through some examples and see if we can figure this out. Right. And look at this. Look at this good example, right? So here in this example, I have sulfurs in different form. The first one is neutral. Second one is in, in its anionic form. The third one is in its ionic compound, right? And this is more like a, the first one is the covalent compound, right? So let's start following the. And this is something what I said earlier, right? All the way to think about this area. Increase in oxygen number is the same as increase in positive charge. This is on the way to think about oxidation. And decrease in oxidation number is the same as increase in negative charge. And so again, make sure you are comfortable with this definition as well. Right, so let's calculate the first the first one, H2S. Now remember, this is a neutral compound, right? <coughs> neutral compound means overall charge of hydrogen and sulfur must be equal to zero. And I, I know that hydrogen is always plus one, right? But I have two atoms of those, right? Plus, let me just call the extra number of sulfur as X. If I do that, they must add up because my number six told me that some of the number must equals to total charge. Total charge for this molecule is zero. Then I can do my math. Plus two times plus one times two is two. Plus x equals to zero. X equals to minus two. And that's why that sulfur right here has an oxidation number of minus two. In the SO32 minus. All right. What I'm going to do is. I know my overall charge is two minus. That means if I add the oxygen number of sulfur, let me just call that X again, plus oxygen, that might pull me that. Since that is not in the peroxide form, the oxygen number of oxygen is going to be minus two, but I have three of them atoms, three times minus two, and the sum must be equal to the charge on this anion, which is minus two. So x minus 6 equals to minus 2. If you do your math, x is going to be plus 4. That means that is the oxygen number of the sulfur that I'm interested in. And the last one, Na2SO4. And the easiest way, whenever you're doing an ionic compound, break it apart. It makes your life way easier. All right. I'm going to forget about my metal. Right, and I know that sulfate SO4 always has a negative two charge. Does that make sense? All right, then I'm going to solve for my this sulfur here. All right, we call that X, and I have four of these oxygen atoms. Each of the oxygen atoms has oxygen number of minus two. If I add those up, they must give me minus two overall. So x minus 8 equals to minus 2, therefore x equals to plus 6. So this is the oxygen number of sulfur in sodium sulfate. All right, again, make sure that you remember this as well. Whenever there is an increase in oxidation number, that's called oxidation. Whenever there is decrease in oxidation number, that's reduction because now this is the definition I'm going to use because it's way easier than what we've been talking about. All right, for knowledge check for I'm asking you to calculate the oxygen number of online atoms. Since you are making an effort to watch this video, 
I'm going to give you a hint for this. All right. The way I'm going to think about this is basically to make my life easy, I'm just going to break this apart, right? So basically, I can break this as calcium and ClO2. I'm just going to look at ClO2. But similarly, remember in my earlier slide, I said that sulfate anion is always, always has a negative two charge. Similarly, ClO2 minus. ClO2 always has a negative one charge. That means the sum of oxygen number of chlorine and oxygen always has to be minus one. All right. Now, since I'm trying to figure out the oxygen number of chlorine, let me just call that X plus. For oxygen, I know it's negative two times two equals to minus one. Look at that. All right. And this is how you can figure out the value of X, which will be the Oxygen number of chlorine. All right, so I give you a hint. Hopefully, watching this video helps you answer this question. I'm going to take four questions correctly. All right, so this is an example of what a redox reaction would look like, right? So here, if you look at this, <clears throat> this is a copper wire. All right, and this solution contains silver ions so the one ions that means ag plus All right so it's the same as the silver ion was silver nitrate this solution was silver nitrate since it's ionic i can think about this as ag plus aqueous plus no3 minus aqueous right? and that's why they have said silver one ion because this is silver one ion all right, so what happens is if I stick that copper metal, this copper metal or wire into the solution, over time, this is what's gonna happen. But if you look at C, you see that there's some kind of thing accumulating right around this area, like there's some kind of precipitate, right, kind of occurring around that idea. So what do you think that is? All right. So this right here is a very, very good example of an oxidation reduction or a redox reaction. So if I write down my, just the reaction first, right? This is what's going to look like. My copper solid is reacting with silver nitrate, right? And then this is something called single displacement reaction. My KM115 students, so put it, this rings a bell. If it does not, make sure you go back and revisit the KM115 notes. All right, basically all that's happening, this copper is going to dip, displace this silver. That's why it's called single, single displacement reaction. And my product is going to have silver solid, right? And then the copper nitrate. And look at my solution in my C. This blue color, that's from the copper nitrate solution. That means the copper nitrate is blue in color. And this precipitate that I was pointing at earlier, right, silver colored, was because of the silver that's formed All right now the question is okay that's the single displacement reaction how do i know it is a redox reaction and this is where you have to start practicing writing the two half reactions that we talked about earlier oxygen half and the redox in half and the way to do it is so anyway anytime someone and again this is really important for you to we to start solving all the other things that i'm going to talk about later like galvanic cell and stuff like that all right so make sure you keep this in mind make sure you're getting very comfortable with this and the way i'm going to do that is basically i'm going to write down my copper solid right and i'm going to look at my peroxide now and my copper over here since this is no3 is minus one i have two of them this copper has to be copper two plus right i'm going to go to my other reactant Remember, this AgNO3 is the same as Ag+. My 2Ag+, in the aqueous form, is giving me super solid. Right? Now, I can easily think about this in two ways. If I look at this, I can use this, right? Either the increase in positive charge or the increase in oxidation number is called oxidation. And look at that. This copper went from oxygen number of zero to plus two. That means this has to be my oxidation. 
half. This silver went from plus one to zero, right? Technically, plus two because there are two atoms of this. That's why since there is decrease in oxidation number, right? Going from plus one to zero. That's why this is my reduction half. And do not forget to show your electrons, right? That means for my first part, to make this neutral, copper neutral, if I add plus two electron, negative two charge, plus two charge is going to be zero. Look at that. I just balance the charges out. For this, it's the oxygen reaction reaction. Not surprisingly, this two electron must be picked up by this 2Ag plus. Look at that. Two plus two times plus one charge is going to be plus two charge, plus two charge, plus minus two is going to give you overall zero. And this you will use how you identify and write the oxygen half and the reduction half. All right, so now we're going to practice balancing these redox reactions. All right, so now what I've done is I made your life easy. I've written out all the steps, and since this exam is open book, open note, use this to your advantage. But again, now your goal is to kind of internalize this understanding as to what each of this step means. All right, so this is a dichromate ion right here, reacting with Fe2 plus to give me Cr3 plus and then Fe3 plus, right? As soon as I see this, look at me, look at what we've done earlier, right? What we've said is, Increase in positive or oxidation number was oxidation, right? As soon as I see this, I see this and I'm like, oh, look at this. Two plus going to three plus. Means, oh, that's my increase in oxidation number. That means that has to be my oxidation half, right? So my oxidation half, I'm going to start calling it OH, is going to be my Fe2 plus going to Fe3 plus, right? Because again, like I told you, there was an increase in the oxidation number two plus going to three plus that means the other one not surprisingly has to be my reduction half cr2 o7 2 minus going to cr3 plus is going to be my reduction half and we'll see why in a little bit now, but again, I hope this makes sense. For this, I don't think you have to understand why this is called oxygen half, reaction half, but then again, for balancing, right? It's just way to think about this is basically do the oxygen number count, right? That means this chromium went from a higher oxygen number to three plus. That's why there's a decrease in oxygen number. That's why this species got reduced that's why this is in my last half all right so i just finished my step one it's to write the two half reactions all right next step tells me balance all elements except oxygen and hydrogen i'm going to start balancing them iron iron one one this is balanced but look at my chromium i have two of these in my reaction side i must have two of those do I worry about do I worry about oxygen and hydrogen yet? No, because it tells me step three tells me balance all elements ex except oxygen and hydrogen. Let's go to step three. Step three tells me balance oxygen atoms by adding water molecules. All right. So now the way I'm going to do it is basically there is no oxygen molecule or hydrogen on, in my oxidation half, so you can forget about this. For this half, I have seven atoms of oxygen in my reactant. That means to balance that. I'm going to write down plus seven water because if I do that, do you see how I have seven of oxygens atoms, seven of oxygen atoms, and I balance my oxygen this way. All right, so I hope this makes sense. That was my step three. But when I did that, something happened, right? the extra hydrogen atoms were added now it says balance hydrogen atoms by adding h plus remember h plus has okay it does have plus one charge but then atom wise it has only one hydrogen atom right 
in my this side, do you see how I have seven of water means I have seven times two, 14 of hydrogen atoms to balance that in my, from my peroxide, reactant side, I'm gonna add 14 H plus. 14, ah, man, I hate. Okay, I'm gonna write down my 14 H plus. It doesn't mean erase it, what the hell? Here is it. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, let me just. No, no, my 14 plus right here. 14 H plus. All right. Again, all I did was I balanced the hydrogen atom by adding the H plus ion, right? Since I had 14 of these hydrogen atoms. All right, so now the next thing it's asking me to do is balance charge by adding electrons. Remember, every electron is negative one charge. Anytime you see plus means one plus charge, two plus means plus two charge, and so on. Let's look at my first one. It has plus two charge and then plus three charge. That means what I have to do is I have to balance this out. If I add plus one electron on the peroxide, the charges get balanced. Right? Now let's look at my cr207 side it's a little bit crazy but not to worry all right so let's start counting 14 h plus is plus 14 charge right and then 2 minus 14 plus and 2 minus means 12 plus charge 12 plus charge plus 12 charge in my reactant side and still got my peroxide in my peroxide i have two times three six plus stars now what it's saying to me is balance the charge by adding electrons that means if i add six electrons on my reactant side look at that the plus 12 will balance out with plus six because plus 12 minus six is plus six all right so that means i'm going to add my plus six electron to my reactant side. And again, there's lots of steps. Now, good thing, remember, prior came one finished tense. Came one finished tense, they had to memorize all this. Here, you are given this luxury of literally having the exam as open book, open note. So make sure you use that to your full advantage. By understanding all these steps. And with number six, it says that multiply the two half reactions to the number of electrons in one reaction equals the number of electrons in the other reaction. All right, so I have six electrons in this reaction in the CR207 side. But you see how I have only one electron. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this side of the oxygen half by six. So now it's going to look like six Fe2 plus plus gives me six Fe3 plus plus six electrons. Right. Again, the goal was to make sure that number of electrons on the reduction half balance matches matched with the number of electrons in the oxygen half. And finally, it says add the balanced half reactions. So all I'm going to do is add all these: the reactant side on one side and then product side on the other side. When I do that, I'm going to get something like this. Okay, I'm going to have to use this my whiteboard. And you know what I can. All right, that means it's going to look like this, right? So if I start adding these up, my CR207 to minus plus 6 Fe2 plus plus 14 H plus plus 6 electron on my reactant side. This on my peroxide. My next rule tells me add the balanced half reaction and cancel species that appear on both sides of the equation. So let me do that first. Right? So basically, the six electron cancels with six electron. 
right? Is there anything else I can cancel? No. This is CR207, this is CR3 plus completely different species, FE2 plus, FE3 plus completely different species. All right? Now, there is a thing. It says that under basic media, add OH for step seven. Add OH minus to neutralize H plus and combine to form H2O. Right now, this is your answer for the acidic media. Right? That is after you cancel all the six electron, whatever is left, you write that out. That'll be your answer in the acidic media. Let's see if I ask you to do this reaction in the basic media. And let me show you what does the rules mean. What the rule tells me is under basic media, add OH minus to neutralize the H plus and combine to form H2O. What it means is, what's this? Add OH minus to neutralize H plus. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at my this and I see that, okay, there is my H plus. There are 14 of them. That means to neutralize that, I need to add 14 OH minus. Right, does that make sense? Because remember, I'll, H plus and OH minus, they combine or neutralize to form water. That's why to neutralize this, my rule says that on the basic media, at OH minus to neutralize H plus. One OH minus neutralizes one H plus. That's why to neutralize 14 H plus, I need 14 OH minus. All right, so that means we are 207, two minus plus six Fe2 plus plus. 14H plus to neutralize that, I'm gonna add plus 14OH minus. But keep in mind, you just cannot add the OH minus on one side of the equation, right? You must write that down on the other side of the equation as well. So think about this as algebra, right? When you divide both sides of the equation by two, and when you multiply both sides of the equation by two, and so on, plus. And when you add plus two to both sides of the equation, 14 OH minus, All right? Now, the difference here is, and this is, and combine to form water. H plus and OH minus, they combine to form 14 water, right? This remains the same. And this remains the same, right? So in the end, what I can do is I can subtract seven water from both the sides right because if I subtract seven water from both the sides this gets cancelled out and then I'll be subtracting seven water from putting water 14 molecules of water that means this 14 in the end becomes seven and this is how this reaction can be balanced in a basic media and it takes time and practice because you you I, I don't know work through like four or five problems at least then you get a hang of it. All right. And for your knowledge equation, I'm asking you to balance this redox reaction basic solution. Again, I went through this example of basic solution and I hope this makes sense. the part where I had to add the OH minus to neutralize the H plus and then add those up to give me water and then if I have water on the both sides I can cancel these out right all right so at the beginning of the class I was planning to kind of Finish a lot, but then apparently, wow, I was okay. Yeah, I should be able to do it. Okay. All right. So I think I'm going to go ahead and continue this. And then rather than having two 50 minutes lecture, I'm just going to have uh, one, uh, one hour, 30, 40 minutes lecture. All right. So I'm just going to keep pointing here. I'm not going to have two video lectures. I'll just have one that is going to be about one hour, 30, 40, 45 minutes long, right? But that have, we have been waiting for, right? That battery charging station picture that we talked about.
All right. So <coughs> the concept behind batteries. You have a battery. Let's say simple battery. I might have a AAA battery. All right, and you might have seen this one side has charge, the one side has a negative charge. All right, and if I take a wire, any copper wire, right, attach it to the positive side. If I add on the wire, attach it to the negative side, and then if I have a bulb that connects this wire. Right, we all know that the bulb lights up, assuming the battery hasn't died yet. All right now, again, what we're gonna go through, all right, is basically understanding as to what is really happening in that plus and minus minuses is what we're gonna talk about. Basically, the easy answer is. The only thing that's happening in that plus and minus, whatever that there is inside here, is basically redox reaction. That's all that's happening. There's a redox reaction that's happening in the pluses and minus of that battery that causes the bulb to light up. All right? All right. So word electrochemical cells, what does that mean? So basically, any cells that can generate electricity from either a spontaneous redox reaction, all right, or by using to drive a non spontaneous redox reaction, that's called electrochemical cells, all right. But again, remember, we are most, 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 mostly focused on a spontaneous reaction. Again, the definition of this spontaneous redox reaction is the same as the definition of spontaneous that we have talked about, right? So that any reaction that does not require any outside help for it to occur is a spontaneous redox reaction. All right? Example. Let's say I have this. All right? Let's say I have the metal here, one metal. I have on the metal here, and I just throw some solution here, some liquid. Right, I just leave it there, and if I use the wire and connect it to these metals and metals, all right, and if I can light up this bulb, right, so what I'm telling you is, oh, there is some kind of a spontaneous redox reaction that's happening here that's causing the bulb to light up, right? Now, when that kind of ha when that thing happens, whenever there is a spontaneous redox reaction, this example we call that as galvanic cells so again there are two types of electrochemical cells and right, the first one is galvanic or voltaic cells so for the galvanic or the voltaic cells it can generate the electricity or in other words it can light up a bulb or in other words there's a transfer of electron or movement of electrons all right, because of a spontaneous redox reaction. All right, and there's only type of electrolytic cell, which we're not going to talk about in this class. We're just going to mostly focus on the galvanic cell. All right, we're not going to talk about this at all. But again, just make sure that you know definition. Basically, for the electrolytic cell, the idea is. There is a reaction that happens here, but the issue is this reaction is non-spontaneous. This is the transfer of electron or movement of electrons, redox reaction. But remember, what we have said is even a non-spontaneous reaction can be made spontaneous by the use of outside source, and this is how. The outside source was used to drive this non-spontaneous redox reaction forward. All right, same thing like, so let's see if I say, if I'm a, on a hill and if I have a bicycle, 
if I just leave the bicycle at the bottom of the hill, it's not just going to go up, right? I have to continually push the bicycle up the hill, all right? Because bicycle going up the hill is a non spontaneous process, all right? So again, we're going to focus a lot on this spontaneous galvanic cells reactions. All right, so before that, let's work through some terminologies. Some of you might be familiar with these. So basically, in a galvanic cell or even in an electrolytic cell, you have metals that are dipped in solutions, right? Now, those metals are called electrons, all right? So basically, these electrodes, if you think about this, is basically they complete the circuit between the power, right? Because the power is, I might be using the term wrong. All right, so let me just rephrase that. These metals, these metals basically connect the chemical reaction to the Um, I don't know, bulb, if you would think about this, or let's just say voltmeter, whatever you are trying to measure how much electricity is being generated, right? I could have replaced this bulb with a voltmeter, and you might have gotten a reading. All right, so this is what I mean by uh, electrolyte and external circuit, right? And then it provides a connection between the system in the electrochemical cell. Now, all this is my system, right? This is my one of my system. This is my one of my system. Or both meter could be, and I'm connecting all these with the help of these metal rods, and those metal rods are called electrodes. And you might be wondering, what's the use of electrodes? Really important, right? All right. Even in electrode, we have two types of electrode. One is called the anode. Another is called the cathode. Anode and cathode. Right. In my examples, we have talked about reduction half, as I ring a bell, reduction half. All right. So go back to your notes, review this if you want to review. All right. Now, and this oxygen half always happens in the inner side of the draw. Anode is where the oxygen half reaction happens, and the cathode is where the reduction half reaction happens. All right. All right. So now we're going to move on, keep moving on with the galvanic cells. All right. So basically, like I said, Anode is where, so this is my anode. It's a metal rod made up of copper where the oxidation half happens. And this is my cathode, right? It's a silver cathode, silver metal. This is where my reduction half reaction happens. All right, so now this right here, I'm going to go through like four or five slides. That's going to show you everything that we just talked about and connect this to the galvanic cell. All right, now, a couple of things to keep in mind is basically the reason this external circuit or the bulb or the voltmeter shows some power, right, or electricity in lemma's term is because there is this flow of electrons is you think about this is flow of electrons is current wherever there is current you can light up right uh, voltage is going to be there if you have voltage means you can light up the bulb is you think about this all right all right so now again 
This is where the oxygen half happens because this is my anode side. This is where the reduction half happens because this is where my because this is my cathode side. All right. All right. Now, now think about this right, as to why we call this anode and cathode. The name comes from this kind of this because if it's an anode, the anions flow to the anode. That's why we call that an anode, right? And then we call that a cathode because cations flow to the cathode. And we'll talk about this as to what that means in a little bit. I hope at least this is making sense to help a kind of kind you memorize things. All right, so far so good. And we can talk about this oxygen half and reaction half and what's happening here. All right, so let's look at this. All right, so first we are looking at this reaction, right? Copper solid reacting with silver nitrate, giving me copper nitrate plus. Does that ring a bell? And this is the example that I used earlier, right? This reaction is what we're looking at. I, I even wrote the half reaction for you all, right? So what we had said on this slide is basically is the same reaction over here, right? So I can write this half reaction as this. So again, this is something I already talked about, this copper solid going to copper two plus plus two electron and then you have two ag plus going to two ag solid and then that two electron is picked up by this and what we have said is if there is a gain in oxygen number that's oxidation right do you see how this is going from zero to two plus that's why this is my Oxidation half reaction. This is my reduction half reaction. And what we had said was oxidation reaction occurs at anode. That means this right here, this reaction is happening at anode. And this right here is happening at the cathode. And what we have said is it's negative anions that flow towards the anode as positively charged cations that flow towards the cathode, thus the name anode and then cathode cation. All right. So now let's talk about okay, what you said that a solid metals would make up the anode and cathode, what gives? So basically, what we do in most of the cases is basically whatever solid or metal is in my oxygen half that's the metal i'm going to use as my electrode and look at this since i have a copper solid here that's why my anode is copper here in my oxygen half do you see i have silver here that's why my cathode is going to be made up of silver all right now to create the galvanic cell, I do need some kind of a solution to dip those electrodes into the solution. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna dip my copper in my copper nitrate solution, right? So easy way to think about this is, uh, okay, this is my product, that's my equation solution, that's the solution I'm gonna dip in. That's my reactant silver nitrate. And then I'm gonna dip my silver in my silver nitrate solution. So this solution right here is copper nitrate solution. This solution right here is silver nitrate solution. AZNO3, sorry, aqueous. All right, now keep that in mind. This is a spontaneous reaction, right? Because remember this picture now? Right? Because all I had to do, I didn't have to use any outside force. I didn't have to like pass electricity to the, to the copper wire or anything. All I did was, I took this copper wire, I dipped it in the silver nitrate solution, and I saw that there was some kind of a transfer of electrons that happened that caused this to happen. 
right? Copper nitrate to go back in the solution. And then there's a silver deposition, right? Now, this is a spontaneous reaction. That's why this is a galvanic cell. All right, so I hope all these terminologies that I'm throwing out there is making sense. Take your time, all right? All right. Now, remember what we said earlier was anions flow to the anode, and this is what I mean by this picture right here. Do you see how this nitrate anion is flowing into the anode side, right? Look at this, the Na+, plus, which is a cation, right? Na+, plus is a cation, and NO3- minus is an anion. Since the cation is flowing towards the cathode side, here, the anion NO3 minus, which is an anion, is going to flow towards the anode side. All right? This is what I'm talking about. I'm azimetal cathode in the solution of this. All right? And then finally, do not forget this. We're trying to see that, oh, if it can create electricity, right? In, in other words, can it light a bulb? Or if you connect that to a voltmeter, right? So let's see if you have a voltmeter, will you have some kind of a reading that says, let's say this is my zero volt. Let's say this is my one volt. Will the reading be in between one and zero and one volt or even higher, right? That shows that, oh, okay, there is some kind of a voltage or electric potential difference that has happened in there. All right. And this is the reaction that we're looking at. I've already talked about this reaction. This is my oxidation half reaction. Right, and we see that oxygen half reaction happens at anode. All right, and then this is the part that is really important. Right, basically, what's going to happen here is what is going to light up this battery. Let's see if there's a battery here. Is basically this flow of electrons. So you have anion moving here. Right, this is my anion. All right, now remember in the anode, oxidation is going to happen. Right, that means there is going to be release of electrons. These electrons will going to start moving to these wires. This is what the flow of electrons mean, and the flow of electrons is going to be always from the anode to a cathode in a galvanic cell. And that flow of electron is what lights up this bulb or source of volt reading if there was a voltmeter in there. All right, so that's what it means by this last part. Basically, the voltmeter is indicating the cell's potential. We'll talk about that in the next class as to what does that cell's potential mean. Right, but I hope this makes sense. Flow of electrons from the anode to cathode in a galvanic cell is what is creating the electricity. So we talked about cat anode, let's look at cathode. Cathode is gonna look like this, right? The two electron that the anode side lost is going to be grabbed by the cathode side and then silver is going to be deposited on the silver cathode. All right. All right. So again, this is the charge balance we've already talked about. All right. All right. So now, the example that I gave you, right, whenever we wrote the two half reactions, we just saw two electrons. Right. Okay. One, two electrons was lost by copper solid, and which was used up by Ag plus to reduce itself to Ag solid, right? Silver solid. All right. Now the question is, you see something weird here, right? Okay, everything makes sense here, but then there was something in the middle. And we had termed this salt bridge as to what this is and why does that have sodium nitrate in there, right? So easy way to think about this is first thing the salt bridge basically completes the circuit, right? If you do not have a complete circuit, a bulb cannot light up, right? What's the main thing that salt bridge does? And we're going to talk about as to what is the other important thing that salt bridge does. 
right? So this is how the salt bridge is connecting the solution from anode side to solutions that's on the cathode side. All right. All right. So basically, uh, the salt bridge, which is this, what it does is basically whenever the anions flow towards the anode, example that I gave you, right? anions flowing towards the cathode. Sorry, anode, that's where the anode, right? So whenever the this reaction happens, right, in the anode side, this is my oxidation. Do you see how this electron that we have created is going to start flowing to the other side, right? Is going to flow towards the other side, this fourth electrons. When that happens, what's this? There is a buildup of positive charge here. All right. Now, in my cathode, what's going to happen is that AG plus is going to grab the electrons that the anode side lost. All right. Now, a couple of things are happening simultaneously here. You are building a positive charge Cu2 plus on the anode side, right? And then in the cathode side, the positive cations they become deficient because those are being kind of like reacting with the two electrons to give you the neutral silver right or metal silver and that is where the salt bridge comes into play so whenever i have the salt bridge which have both the cation and the anion what happens is to neutralize this positive ions build up and then the positive ion deficiency The salt bridge can be used. And salt bridge is basically it contains a porous material with a salt solution. The salt solution can be sodium nitrate, and then potassium nitrate are some of the generally used ones. And then because of this, salt bridge is what enables the electrically neutrality to be achieved and then this circuit is going to be complete and then the current is going to keep flowing and then going to keep lighting up the bulb all right so i hope this solid concept makes sense and again the idea is basically to kind of neutralize the buildup of positive charge on the anode side and then to kind of replace the cations on the cathode side right to replace the cations in the cathode side to neutralize the surplus or more of the positive ions that built up in the anode side we use the salt breeze which consists of a considered salt solution right sodium nitrate and potassium nitrate that has a cationic portion as well as an anionic portion all right well, this makes sense lots of new jargons take your time and not surprising right if you look at this sentence whenever i say anions flow towards the anode anions is a negative charge neutralize the build up positive charge right and not surprisingly the anions are the one that's going to flow towards the anode to neutralize the positive charge, right? Because negative and positive, they can come together to give you something called electrical neutrality. And same thing over here, right? Whenever there is a deficiency of positive charge, you pull in some cations which are positive charge, 
and that deficiency can be cured. All right, so based on this concept, let's try to answer this LX question. And then this is the last slide for today, where I'm going to talk about how to design a scanning cell from a single distance reduction reaction. And remember, the example I gave you, the example that I focus on a lot, this is also an example of single displacement reaction. Right? Instead of this, I said this was the same as copper reacting with silver nitrate, because this is the same as silver cation, giving you copper nitrate plus AZ solid. So this is the single displacement reaction that was used to create this galvanic cell. Right? So now this question asks you the same thing. It gives you another single displacement reaction. Magnesium solid reacting with zinc sulfate, giving you magnesium sulfate and then zinc. As soon as I see this, I'm going to start writing my half reactions, right? Magnesium solid going to magnesium 2 plus. Right? To neutralize, to get to zero, I add two electrons, or in other words, this magnesium had to lose two electrons to get to magnesium two plus, right? My other half is gonna look like I have zinc two plus on my reactant side, is gonna gain that two electron, giving me a neutral zinc solid, right? Lots of ways to figure out which one is my reduction half, which one is my oxidation half. All you have to do is, if there is a gain of electron, that's my reduction, right? GER Lewis lines is GER. If there is loss of electron, is oxidation. Or if there's an increase in positive charge, that's oxidation. If there is decrease in positive charge, that's reduction. If there's an increase in oxidation number, that's an oxidation. If there is a reduction or if there is decrease in oxidation number, that's reduction, right? So I see that there's an increase in oxidation number. Increase in oxidation number is oxidation. That's why this is my oxidation half. I'm going to start calling that OH. That means the other one has to be my reduction half. And what I said was in my oxidation half, always occurs in the anode. My reduction half always occurs in my cathode. Based on this, I think I have answered most of this question here. All right, so write a balanced equation for the half reaction that happens at the cathode. I go to my cathode. That means this is going to be my balanced reaction. I hope the first one makes sense. The second one says write a balanced reaction for the half reaction that happens at the anode. Not surprisingly, anode. Boom. Look at that of what substance is E1 made, right? Remember this E1, you see how I know this is my anode side is because, you see how this electron has flown from this side to the other side? And we said that the electrons always flows from the anode side to the cathode side. That's why I know that this is my anode. So E1 is my anode. And I said that the anode metal is made up of the metal that we usually use. That's why the anode side is E1 is made up of magnesium. E2 is my cathode side. Cathode side is going to be made up of my zinc metal. All right, the last one, what are the chemical species in solution S1? I'm going to go to my S1. What do you think are going to be my chemical solution? Right? Definitely magnesium 2 plus for sure, because remember I told you if you have magnesium, my solution that I'm going to dip that is going to be my product solution, right? Now, MgSO4, remember, that's in a solution form, right? That means the chemical species in solution S1 is going to be my Mg2 plus and then sulfate anion. Chemical species in my S2 is going to be my zinc 2 plus and Sulfate and ion. All right. And doesn't ask me anything about the salt base, but do you see how this, this is a salt base? Right. So it probably contains some sodium nitrate or potassium nitrate. All right. That's why, if 
if you want to match up the anion, you can even use sodium sulfate and then potassium sulfate as salt bridge as well for this case. All right, so last slide for today. This is just basically knowledge check. Now, what I'm asking you is for the copper Ag plus galvanic cell. So this is the one that I've been talking about throughout the whole day, right? So this is the copper and Ag plus galvanic cell. This is the copper and Ag plus galvanic cell. So what I'm asking you for this galvanic cell is analytic like six is i'm asking you what is the balanced reaction of the half reaction that happens at the anode and then the balanced reaction of the half reaction that happens at the cathode that have, I've already, i think i've already answered if you just go back to the video lecture and watch the last five minutes i think i've already answered it so I'm going to stop here, and like I said, I thought I would get done uh, pretty quick, but then again, I think uh, since I've explained so much stuff, um, I'm going to stop here. So this is the only video that you're going to have for today, right? Because I think it's already one hour, almost like 40, 50 minutes now. All right, so the knowledge check six, you should be able to answer all the questions of knowledge check, knowledge check six up to now. Right, good luck, and then we're going to talk about cell notation tomorrow.